Oh my god. I only watch jump scare free, slow burn, bone chilling, atmospheric, character driven horror films that have lots of tension and build up and stuff. Jump scares don't scare me at all. Is this the teaser for the newest slow burn, bone chilling, atmospheric A24 release? You know, the one without jump scares and proper character development? Excuse me, sir, do you have the newest bone chilling, slow burn, atmospheric, and character development driven A24 release on Blu ray? I exclusively watch jump scare free films. What the hell? What do you mean with this has jump scares? I exclusively watch slow burn, bone chilling, atmospheric A24 released horror films with proper character development. Established in 2012, A24, named after the A24 motorway in Italy, has quickly grown into quite the entertainment juggernaut in the independent scene. They were kind of a dark horse. Their first film, A Glimpse Inside the Mind of Charles Swan III, which was directed by Roman Coppola, was absolutely terrible. I remember seeing the film when it first came out, and I saw that it was from a new distribution company, and I thought to myself, they don't stand a chance. I was pleasantly surprised though with the release of Harmony Corinne's Spring Breakers, which I still maintain is criminally underrated. With this film, I think that they found their footing and established their niche because after that, they started pumping out just tons and tons of critically acclaimed low to mid budget movies. And it was with Moonlight's Best Picture win in 2017 that A24 cemented themselves, at least with mainstream audiences as the prestige picture distributor slash studio. In the last nine years, they've released modern classics like Good Time, Uncut Gems, The Lighthouse, Minari, Ex Machina, The Lobster, and many more. Their critical and commercial success over the years also helped them garner a cult-like fan base. And let me tell you, it can be pretty cult-like. Some of you may know that one of my hobbies is making fun of some A24 fans. I don't dislike the films, but I do find that some people's almost religious devotion to the brand to be kind of cringe. And honestly, that kind of brand attachment probably goes against a lot of what the A24 filmmakers stand for. Maybe most big fandoms are just as cringe and I just notice it more because I interact with it more. But still, every time I think of the A24 fan base, I just can't forget that Facebook post where someone claimed that Come and See had A24 vibes. But perhaps what they're best known for is their selection of horror films. The horror movies that they choose to release are often artsier than what their competitors, Blumhouse, put out. When you go to the cinema to see an A24 horror movie, you can presume that it's going to be moody, character driven, and you might not get all the answers. You're going to have to do a little thinking. So before I jump into ranking the A24 films from my least favorite to my most favorite, I'm going to have to set some guidelines. For one, it's hard to define what horror is with their movies, but I'm going to consider any films that they marketed to be horror films as horror films. This is why I'll include films like It Comes at Night, even though it's not a horror movie. Also, and this can't be said enough, this is all my personal preference. I sometimes like to think that I have the superior taste in film. But a lot of these movies are on pretty even footing as far as overall quality goes, so the numbering really just comes down to my own personal taste for many of these rankings. And lastly, wait till the end because I've got a few YouTuber friends of mine to give me their rankings and I'll compare theirs to mine as, as a fun little thing. So without further ado, let's start with the worst of the worst. Number 17, Tusk. Kevin Smith make a good movie challenge, impossible. I went into Tusk with an open mind. I really did. I wanted to like it because somewhere deep down inside of me, I want Kevin Smith, the master of crying at cape shit on Twitter, to make a good movie. That being said, Tusk is one of the worst movies I've ever seen. It starts off with a podcast that's so unfunny that it caused me physical pain, and it's only downhill from there. The story is simple enough. An arrogant podcast host, Justin Long, travels to Canada to conduct an interview for his show, which is called The Nazi Party, as in N-O-T-S-E. 
E due to the fact that the co-host, played by Haley Joel Osment, does not go on the trips with Long, so Long has to recount his experiences to him on the show. Got it? He doesn't see the sights or the interviews. Not see. I'm sure you're all slapping your knees right about now. I know I am. So this guy goes to Canada to interview the Kill Bill kid, which is just a boomer tier reference to the age old meme of the Star Wars kid, but he instead interviews this old man after finding a note in a bathroom. He drives to this old man's house, and while interviewing him and playing around with a walrus penis, he finds that his tea has been spiked. He passes out and thus begins his transformation into a walrus. It's fitting that Justin Long's character's name is Wallace, because it sounds like walrus, get it? That's really funny top tier comedy stuff. What follows are two plot lines, one in which the crazy old man turns Wallace into a walrus, and the other follows Haley Joel Osment and Wallace's girlfriend, who are having a secret affair, go figure, as they try to locate and eventually save their friend. If the first part of the movie was painful but passable, then the second part is just painful. It's a mix of body horror light with mystery, as Osmond and Rodriguez enlist the aid of Detective Guy Lepoint, played by Johnny Depp, to help them find their friend. Let me tell you, this has to be Depp's worst role. His accent is unlistenable and he won't stop talking. I can't believe that an actor of his caliber took on a role like this. But then again, he did star in Mordecai. As bad as his character is, I think the worst aspect of the second half of Tusk is how the pacing just turns to shit. It feels so much longer than it actually is. And it doesn't help that everything that happens is just dumb. It's not dumb in a funny way either. It's dumb in a dumb way. The film waits until the ending credits to make sense of the whole thing. Smith reveals that the whole story of the film stemmed from an idea on his podcast. I assume he was stoned when making the story up. At least I hope he was. It should have just remained a stupid movie idea on his podcast. Number 16, False Positive. This is a newer movie that just recently came out. I hadn't heard anything about it until I started researching for this video. There's a reason why. A24 was right to not put much money into marketing this movie and releasing it as a Hulu exclusive. A24 usually knows when they have a stinker on their hands, and so they don't promote it as much as their better films. Because of that, you might have never heard of some of the films on this list. False Positive has a pretty simple story. A young married couple, Lucy and Adrian, are having difficulty having kids, so they go to a famous fertility doctor, Dr. Hindle, who was actually Adrian's mentor. Dr. Hindle is known for almost always being successful with his patients. And sure enough, Lucy finds herself pregnant with triplets, two boys and one girl. She decides to keep the girl, but something doesn't seem right. Her friends, her husband, and Dr. Hindle all seem to be in on some sort of conspiracy. It feels like a Lifetime or Hallmark version of Rosemary's Baby, but the ending isn't nearly as revelatory as that film. In fact, it's downright stupid. If you're worried about spoilers for this glorified TV movie, then skip ahead a few seconds. But the revelation is that the secret sauce to Dr. Hindle's success is, well, his own secret sauce, if you catch my drift. Like most TV movies, it's a film I watched and almost entirely forgot five minutes after finishing it. Just go watch the Gamer From Mars' video on the gynecologist from hell instead. Number 15, Lamb. This should have been a short film. You can cut out a whole third of the movie and nothing would change. Now, I'm not complaining about it being slow. I'm a big fan of Belatar. I love slow films, when they're good. If you saw the trailer, then you know the story. And that's a problem, because the film tries to hide the fact that they're raising a half-lamb, half-human hybrid creature until over half an hour into the movie. It's meant to be a shock when you first see it, but if you saw any marketing material for the movie, then you know what's coming, and if you're like me, you're just annoyed that the movie tries and fails to hide this epiphany for so long. The only shock is how uncanny and weird the CGI is. I guess that's A24's fault more than the filmmaker's fault, but how are they supposed to market the movie if they can't show Ada, that's the lamb's name? That's more of a nitpick than an actual issue with the movie. The reason I don't think Lamb is good is that it's extremely superficial while treating itself as something greater. I'm hesitant to use this word, but I think that pretentious is apt for Lamb. The message of the movie is pretty obvious. If you mess with nature, then nature will mess with you. There's also a message about acceptance that is in the part of the film that could have been excised entirely. Since you may want to see the movie, I won't spoil it but it had one of the dumbest endings I've seen in an A24 horror movie. 
I'm not even sure if it is a horror film. It feels more like a parody of A24 horror, but it takes itself pretty seriously the whole time, so maybe it's an unintentional parody. You might like it, but I found it to be a pretty hollow film whose only strength was its pretty shots of the Icelandic countryside. Everything else just fell flat and made me wish that the movie was significantly shorter. Number 14, The Monster. This is kind of a nothing movie. It's just very average. It's a story about a young mom, Kathy, and her daughter, Lizzie, who are on their way to the Lizzie's dad's house when their car breaks down after Kathy hits a wolf. Stranded on a lonely road at night, a mysterious monster haunts them. The monster isn't in most of the film. Most of the film consists of flashbacks that show how terrible of a mom Kathy is. She's an alcoholic who acts more juvenile than her own child. CPS should have taken Lizzie away from her long ago due to her constant neglect. And thus, the monster in this movie is clearly an allegory for Kathy's own self-destructiveness. I have read some people interpret the movie as representing her alcoholism, but I think it's a little broader than that, although her alcoholism plays a large role in her loser lifestyle. Once I understood this, which was pretty early on in the movie, I lost most of my interest, though I really do like Zoe Kazan as an actress, and I think she did a good job in her role. The movie just isn't scary and lacks a lot of tension, feeling more like an okay domestic drama than a horror film. Number 13, The Hole in the Ground. This Irish horror film feels kind of like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. A mother and her son move to a small town in the Irish countryside to get away from what we can assume is an abusive husband. They try to make the best of their situation by renovating the house and befriending the locals, but there's a dark secret in the woods. That secret, the hole in the ground, just like the movie's title. He said it! He said it! It's this large sinkhole in the middle of the woods that you just know has to have some kind of monster in it or something. The woman's son goes missing in the woods and she finds him next to this hole in the ground. Oh, that's why they call it that. Then, over the course of the film, she begins to think that it's not actually her son, but some kind of imposter. She hears a tale of this happening to another lady in the town and causes her to go on a downward spiral of paranoia and fear. Just as she becomes more paranoid, her son also becomes more violent and abusive to her. I really like how this film uses the mother's paranoia to build tension, and how there is a parallel between her worsening relationship with her son and her implied relationship with her ex-husband. It makes you think, is he actually an imposter, or is she just seeing her ex and her child? That being said, this movie feels more like a Blumhouse film than an A24 film. I don't know exactly how to back up that statement, except to say that it's just got more of the Blumhouse style in terms of cinematography and storytelling. And also, this is the first film in the list that I'd actually recommend to people who wanted to watch a spooky movie. Consider every movie, starting with this one, to get my recommendation. Because of that, I'll try to keep spoilers to a minimum from here on out. Number 12. The Black Coat's Daughter. Satanic panic in a girl's boarding school? <laughs> Count me in! Oh, wait. It's not an anime. This movie is a lot of people walking around and doing normal things with spooky music playing, which can often feel like a bit much. But the moments with horror in them really hit. The film intertwines the storyline of three girls, Rose, Kat, and Joan, during a school break in the middle of winter at a fairly isolated Christian boarding school. Kat and Rose stay behind during the school break, waiting for Kat's parents to arrive. Rose notices Kat exhibiting strange behavior during this time and fears that she might be possessed by a demon. The strongest aspect of this film is the way in which it tells an otherwise pretty straightforward story. Oz Perkins elects to show the film in a non-linear manner and from the perspectives of the three different girls, which causes scenes to change color as Perkins further explores them from different points of view. The twist in this movie is pretty apparent for anyone who's paying attention, but I didn't mind it so much. Overall, it's a pretty solid atmospheric horror film. Number 11, It Comes at Night. Okay, so I actually like this movie quite a bit. I think the director of it, Trey Edward Schultz, is fantastic. He also directed Krisha and the highly underrated Waves. Seriously, Waves was great and it got no traction for some reason. Fun fact, Schultz was an intern on my favorite movie of all time, Terrence Malick's The Tree of Life. Why I'm putting It Comes at Night so low on this list is because it's not a horror movie. I don't know why A24 thought it was a good idea to market it as such, unless they only really cared about box office sales from the first weekend of its release. 
anyone who has seen the film can tell you. It's a post-apocalyptic domestic thriller slash drama. The film plays on familial tensions, the fear of the other, and the fear of a deadly contagion. But the trailers made it seem like there was some monster in the woods that only came out at night. That's why I think a lot of people ended up hating this movie. A24 promised them one thing, and they got something totally different. It has to be one of the worst marketing campaigns from a prestigious company that I've seen in a long time. The film had great writing, acting, and cinematography. I love how the aspect ratio changes to ease us from the world of the real to the world of the dreams. It's a fine follow-up to his breakout hit, Krisha, and it deserves a lot better than it got. I was thinking about not including it on this list, but I wanted the excuse to complain about how Schultz got done dirty by A24. Hopefully, as some time passes, his films will get the recognition they deserve. Number 10, Enemy. What was it about 2013 in doppelganger movies? Enemy, based off of Jose Saramago's novel, The Double, came out at the same time as Richard Ayoade's movie, the Double, which was an adaptation of Dostoevsky's novel, The Double. Lots of doubles. This film sees Jake Gyllenhaal play as both protagonist and antagonist, history professor Adam and B-list actor Anthony. Adam suffers from the modern man's malaise, an unfulfilled life of constant repetition. It's a hollow version of the myth of Sisyphus. He follows his daily routines. He gives the same lectures every day. His relationship with his girlfriend is lame at best. Needless to say, he's in a rut. But that all changes when one of the other professors recommends him a movie, because as he's watching that movie, he sees that the actor playing as the bellhop looks just like him. This plunges him into a rabbit hole as he wants to find out who this guy is, but he makes the mistake of letting his doppelganger into his life, as Anthony is, hmm, not exactly a good guy. This film was directed by Denis Villeneuve. You might be familiar with some of his work. Let's see, Dune, Blade Runner 2049, Arrival, Sicario, Prisoners. Yeah, he's pretty famous now, but he made Enemy when he wasn't quite a household name. So if you're a fan of his later work, I highly recommend going back and checking out his earlier films, this included. This is definitely a Villeneuve film, from the sleek visuals to the slow but intentional pacing. He color graded the film to have the sickly yellow permeate every frame, which complements Gyllenhaal's performances. It adds to the oppressive atmosphere of Adam's world and puts us in this unhealthy state of mind. Villeneuve keeps us guessing about what these characters are going to do, how sane Adam and or Anthony are, and whether or not the doppelganger is real, that maybe Anthony is Adam. There's also this subplot about giant spiders in underground sex clubs. It's pretty cool. The movie feels like a Kafka story that Kafka never wrote. Number 9. Midsummer. I can already hear the clicking of the keyboards from the white girls writing angry comments about me, placing Midsummer low on this list. But I have a well thought out response to assuage your potential anger and help you understand why I placed it this low. Gonna cry? <laughs> Look, I think Midsummer is a fine film. The decision to have almost the entire film take place during the day was a brave one and the cinematography and general set design is top notch. Adding to that, I really can't complain about any of the performances. Florence Pugh does a fantastic job carrying the film, and everyone else generally feels believable in their roles. Spoiler alert for this section, by the way. The cult aspect of the movie is also cool. I like some of the world building, like how they view their lives in terms of seasons, how they all die at 72, and how there's a chosen one, in this case a deformed and mentally deficient man, who writes their holy scriptures, which the elders have to interpret. All of that is super interesting. What I don't like about Midsummer is how it's bogged down by a rather, in my opinion, pedestrian breakup story. Danny and Christian are in a relationship that's not so great, but I've seen way worse. It just seems like a relationship in which they've grown apart and just need to end it. It's not that captivating and honestly just kind of boring. I don't like how Aster made this plotline the focus of the film when there are so many more interesting things going on here. The movie also suffers from the horror trope of characters just being stupid. Did Josh actually think he could get away with sneaking into the sacred temple to take photos of their holy scripture without being caught? Mind you, this was right after the elder shut him down and chastised him for even asking if he could, and Mark went and just pissed on the ashes of the two people who had just been killed and burned. Granted, he was drunk and he might not have seen it. And after 
remember everything that happened. Why did Christian drink that cocktail of drugs, knowing full well that it was going to mess him up? He didn't seem into it, but he drank it anyways. The scene where he runs out of the one building nude, you know, after impregnating the redhead, feels a bit weird to me. It seems like the more natural reaction he would have had would have been to go to his bed and put on some clothes. But he just sort of wanders around the camp, visiting the dead bodies of his friends. That sequence also feels really off because just a few seconds before, he was completely out of it from the drugs. I guess his post-nut clarity just hit different that time. I know that some people take issue with Danny choosing to sacrifice Christian rather than the other guy, but she did just see him having sex with another girl. And trust me, she and most women are not that interested in the particulars about the how and the why. I don't think it matters to her if it wasn't exactly consensual. I know a lot of women out there like to treat her like she's some girl boss or something, but she's punishing him for being a shitty boyfriend and for being raped. As far as for the final barn burning scene, it's not nearly as iconic as the end of Wicker Man. I'll leave it at that. For as much as I've criticized this movie, I still like it. I think it's a fun film, and I don't mind that some women treat this as their joker. Number 8. Hereditary The Ari Aster films are right next to each other because I think that they're generally of the same quality, although Hereditary is definitely a tighter film. Everything in this movie feels intentional. It's all building up to this world of satanic hell prince worshippers. And the more you watch this film, the more everything makes sense. So this is definitely a movie that benefits from multiple viewings. My favorite aspect of the film is the use of miniatures. I love that one shot near the beginning where it zooms in on the room in a miniature house, and then it becomes the real room. It's amazing. Aster uses the miniatures to give backstory to the characters, but he also uses it to give us this sense of fate, a lack of free will within this world. Looking at the miniatures may be what it's like for the Prince of Hell to look at our world. To look at us, everything is placed exactly where it needs to be, divined by some larger creator. The dolls can't do anything that the artist doesn't allow. The characters in Hereditary are merely on a path towards the inevitable. Everything they do is helping to bring about this prophecy. They think they're acting of their own self-will, but we see that to be false. Go and watch the movie again. You'll see that some key events are foreshadowed way before they happen. For example, the symbol of the demonic prince is on the infamous telephone pole, where probably the most shocking scene of the movie happens. I also just like how weird Millie Shapiro looks in this movie. She's so creepy. She's an e-girl now, weirdly enough. I know I've only really had praise for this movie, so why is it here on my list and not higher up? As much as I do like it, it just didn't click with me to make me love it. That could be the effect of the marketing hype for this film, with A24 claiming that this was the scariest movie of all time. I remember that there was a thing that they did where they took people's heart rates while watching this film to show just how terrifying it was. Well, it's not the scariest film of all time. I think maybe I was expecting too much out of it, because I've grown to like it more and more as time has passed, and I can start to separate it from whatever hype I was drawn into. But as I said, this is a very subjective list, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with having this one higher up on your own. Number 7. The Killing of a Sacred Deer The tragedy of Iphigenia is a Greek myth in which the goddess Artemis forces the king Agamemnon to sacrifice his eldest daughter, Iphigenia, to her if he wants to bring his army to Troy. Why? Because he accidentally killed one of her sacred deer. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, daughter for a deer. Lanthimos loosely adapts the myth, setting it in modern-day Columbus, Ohio. The Agamemnon of the movie is a surgeon Dr. Stephen Murphy, and the movie's version of Artemis is Martin, chillingly portrayed by Barry Keown. Lanthimos trades kings in wars for surgeons in hospitals, but the basic story remains pretty similar. Dr. Murphy accidentally killed Martin's father during surgery prior to the events of the film. After the accidental manslaughter, Martin makes an arrangement with Dr. Murphy, meeting him regularly at a cafe to talk, using him as a father figure. Martin then pushes for Dr. Murphy to couple with his mom, effectively making him Martin's stepdad. But since Dr. Murphy is married, he refuses. That doesn't please him. Not one bit. 
Since Dr. Murphy won't replace the deceased dad, Martin decides that the only way to enact justice is to force Dr. Murphy to kill one of his own family members. The kids both come down with a strange illness, paralyzing them. It's only a matter of time before his entire family dies. Dr. Murphy can do nothing and let them all die, or he can actively kill one, saving the rest of the family. Tensions rise as he tries to make a decision, and all of his family members vie for his favoritism in hopes that he will spare their lives. And it all leads up to a heart-stopping conclusion. What else do you want me to do? Something to put an end to all of this. That's what I want. Can you do that? I'm a sucker for mythical stories, I'll be honest. And I'm a big fan of Yorgos Lanthimos, although Dogtooth is still my favorite film of his. This film, though, combines clinical yet beautiful cinematography, an eerie score made up of dissonant and atmospheric sounds, and a darkly heightened reality in this examination of justice and symbolic exchange. It's a trance-inducing film that doesn't try for any shocks or scares, but rather fills you up with fear. I do have a couple of gripes with this film, though. I think the stilted dialogue and acting worked better for Lanthimos' dark comedies, like The Lobster, than for this film. I would have preferred a just slightly more natural style. I also thought that Dr. Murphy's story about his incestuous encounter with his father was a bit out of place and overly crude. But these are just minor issues, and I still think it's a stellar film. But Doc did this still better. Number 6. Saint Maud. I think that COVID really screwed up the release for this film. I remember waiting to see it in the theater, but then it never came to me. The whole pandemic thing happened, and then this movie was only on DirecTV for a while. It had a very, very weird release, jumping from one streaming platform that I had never heard of to another streaming platform that I had also never heard of. So the only way for me to watch this was to get a Paramount Plus subscription. Or was it Peacock? I don't know anymore. Thankfully, at the time of making this video, it has just released on Blu-ray. So I picked up a copy and forgot about those streaming services. They don't exist to me anymore. With this kind of weird release, you would think that A24 thought that this film was gonna bomb. I was going into it expecting it to suck, but it doesn't. It's awesome. Saint Maud is the inverse of satanic panic. It's the story of a woman so possessed by God, or so she thinks that she's driven to commit questionable acts. Maud, a recent Christian convert, works as an at-home nurse, sort of like hospice at home. She's assigned to care for Amanda, an aging dance choreographer dying of cancer. They quickly bond, despite the previous nurse describing Amanda as a certain word that starts with a C. Maud opens up to Amanda, revealing that she can feel God. She physically feels bad things when she does the wrong thing, and she is filled with pleasure when she does the right thing. It's quite strange. There's a scene on a stairway where she's just writhing in pleasure all the way up, and it was both very uncomfortable and funny simultaneously. Maud grows bolder and bolder in her mission to save Amanda's soul. This means shutting off Amanda from her friends and especially her lover, Carol. Is this because Maud is opposed to their lesbian relationship or because Maud is jealous of Carol? But as Maud pushes, Amanda pushes back and Maud's grip on reality loosens and the film plunges from a domestic religious thriller into a straight up horror film. It's amazing that this is Rose Glass's debut. It's a more than solid first film and I am excited for whatever film she puts out next. I would say that Saint Maud isn't as much about religion as it makes itself out to be. I think it's more about mental illness and sexual repression, with Maud transforming her desire for sex into a religious act. To her, God isn't some all-powerful, esoteric, omnipotent, and omnipresent being. He's her boyfriend. She latched on to religion after a traumatic event, but like a lot of new converts, she doesn't actually understand it, and left to her own devices she is led astray. It's a film that just gets under your skin and stays with you for a long time. And Morphid Clark's performance as Maud is one of my all-time favorite horror performances. Number 5. Green Room Anyone who saw Blue Ruin knew that Jeremy Saulnier was a guy who really knew how to make films so thick with tension that you could just reach out with a knife and cut them. And although I love Blue Ruin, Green Room was just next level. A touring punk band runs into some difficulty with money and venues, so a guy that interviews them sets them up to play at a club in the woods. There's one catch. They're skinheads. There's already a clash because our hero band is definitely more left-leaning politically. Well, aside from covering a famous Dead Kennedy song, the concert goes smoothly. That is, until they find a dead body in the green room. 
that's when shit hits the fan. Wanting to protect themselves from these outsiders who are likely to squeal to the cops, the skinheads lock the band in the green room, but our heroes know that if they don't escape, then it's certain death. What follows is one of the most nerve-wracking films I think I've ever seen. As the band fights their way through the skinhead club that has laid siege to them, we can feel the primal drive to survive in the main characters, and the shocking and bloody violence only serves to heighten the suspense. Maybe it's technically more of a thriller, but these kinds of movies get to me more so than traditional horror films. One wrong move on an otherwise regular day put these kids at death's door and Patrick Stewart's turn as Darcy, the owner of the club, is horrifying. That character deserves to stand alongside other classic horror characters like Hannibal Lecter or Michael Myers. And Anton Yelchin is just great as the leading man. He has this quiet, reserved intensity to him, grounding the film. He's just a normal guy in a bad situation. It's so tragic how he lost his life at such a young age. I could easily see him becoming a huge star. So go watch Green Room and pour one out for the homie Anton. Number four, Under the Skin. The first time I saw Under the Skin was at a press screening way back in 2013. Glazer's hypnotic alien invasion movie enraptured me, and so I was confused by, upon leaving the screening, so many of the critics I had watched the film with hating on it. They were just railing against it in the cinema lobby, calling it a cheap knockoff of the man who fell to earth. It's not, by the way. And a whole slew of other insults. I didn't get their hatred back then. And the film has only gotten better with time, in my opinion. Glazer blends documentary with fiction, crafting a sort of skewed reality. Scarlett Johansson's turn as this seductress alien, this spacely succubus, is one of her more interesting roles. What's super interesting is that some of the men she picked up in her car were not actors, but regular people. We typically don't know when someone in the film is an actor or non-actor, so the film feels more like it's set in our own reality. Glazer contrasts the scenes shot by hidden cameras in her van with scenes filled with surrealistic sci-fi beauty. We go from driving on the road, interacting with random travelers and hitchhikers, to scenes inside a dark, liminal space. She seduces these men to ensnare them in her trap, undressing until all they're wearing is their skin, and that is the moment they sink. Inside this dark goo, their skins are stolen from them and given to another alien. This isn't a Roland Emmerich alien invasion. It's something more insidious. The aliens are among us, weaponizing our own sexual desires against our species. Who is human and who is a skinwalker? Will we ever know? Glazer cuts a bit deeper than just that, though, as he uses the film to explore what it means to be human. The female, though distant at first, grows more and more attached to humanity and tries to peacefully live here on Earth not as a predator, but as a person. Will she ever be human? That is the question. Number three, The Witch. You knew this was gonna be high up. It had to be. Eggers is a beast. Undoubtedly, he is my favorite director to come out of the A24 scene. This is his first film, and it's amazing. In this dark fairy tale, a community of pilgrims in New England expels the family after they deem the father a heretic. Outside the protection of the town and church, the family must survive on the edge of a large wood. And inside that wood lurks an ancient evil, a witch. The witch first preys upon the baby, using its blood as nourishment, before attacking the other children. An evil infects the family, ripping it apart from within. At the center of the plague stands Thomason, Anya Taylor-Joy in her breakout role. She faces an important decision. Live morally or live deliciously. The film probes the danger of being cut off from community, the insidious nature of evil, the punishment of sin, and the strength of temptation. The image of the cabin on the edge of the woods tells you everything. The cabin and the farm represent a kind of order, man's conquering of nature. But the woods, a place of chaos and evil, stands tall, dark, and infinite, ready to swallow the farm whole. It's not a matter of if the woods will consume this helpless family. It's when. Egger's commitment to historical accuracy is unparalleled in modern cinema. He and his brother crafted this film from old folk stories from the era and used writings from that time to compose the historically accurate dialogue. Eggers did everything he could to purify the story, setting, and characters of all modern influence. This is not a film that is a modern take on an old tale, but rather, an old tale unearthed for a modern audience. Number two, Climax. This movie has no right being as good as it is. 
it was shot in just 15 days with three days of rehearsal and only a one page outline. All the dialogue is ad-libbed and most of the cast are professional dancers, but not professional actors. On top of that, the dancers come from a variety of schools and styles, so Noe wasn't even sure if their clashing styles would even mesh. On paper, this sounds like a disaster, but in practice, it might be one of the best dance films ever made. It also might be one of Gaspar Noe's best films to date, though Irreversible is also up there. This movie is about the experience of watching it. It was described by critics as a dance party from hell, which feels apt. A dance troupe rehearses their choreography and throws an epic dance party. It's epic because someone spiked the sangria with acid. Noe is like our Virgil, guiding us deeper and deeper into a feverish nightmare of dance, music, sex, drugs, and violence. Noe opens the film by showing the interviews with all the dancers on an old TV with tapes and movies on the side, letting the audience know that they're in for a treat. This isn't your standard dance movie. I mean, look at the movies on the right side of the frame. Possession, Suspiria, Eraserhead, and yeah, Sallow or the 120 Days of Sodom. The man has Kino taste. One of my very favorite movies ever. The camera glides through the scenes like some kind of specter. There are several shots in this film that last for several minutes, and Noe's use of the long shot is intoxicating. To also think that he pulled off these complicated shots without a script. The dude is a madman. There is also a constant undercurrent of music. Noe pulled from legendary electronic artists like Giorgio Moroder, Aphex Twin, and Daft Punk. It's an unrelenting beat, shoving the film forward but also playing with our own senses. Noe's use of the soundtrack does a great job in moving the dancers and us, the audience, from a dance party into the depths of hell. Climax is nightmarish hypnotism on film. It's an unforgettable cinematic experience. Oh, and in case you didn't know, this is only tangentially related, but you can buy nude photographs of Gaspar Noe on Vincent Gallo's website. I am not joking. Number one, The Lighthouse. Anyone who has followed me on this channel would have seen this coming from a mile away. I absolutely love The Lighthouse. It's one of my all-time favorite movies, and it is my favorite movie released by A24. This is one of the few films that I've watched three times in two days. I just couldn't get enough of it. The old-timey cinematography, the exquisite performances by two of my favorite modern actors, the pacing, the atmosphere, the seabirds, the music, the foghorns, the everything. It's so great. You can practically taste the salt spray coming off the screen. I gotta be honest. I also love this film because thanks to it, I have somewhat of a YouTube career. My video on The Lighthouse got my channel monetized. So, Robert Eggers, if you're watching this, thanks for helping me secure the bag, bro. If you want to hear my breakdown and analysis of The Lighthouse, I'll leave a link to the video in my description below. Well, there you have it. This is how I rank every A24 horror movie, at least out of the ones that I've seen. If I've missed any, let me know in the comments. I'm sure you will. But a ranking like this doesn't denote the objective quality of each film, but rather my own subjective experiences with these movies. The movies that I consider to be good are all actually pretty close in quality. There were some movies that were pretty bad, I'd say, and some that were just kind of mediocre. But overall, I think A24 has released more good films than bad films. Maybe a year from now, my list will be different. Heck, it's changed a few times while making the video. Something like this is more fun than serious, and it's cool to see how other people stack these films up against one another. So I reached out to some friends of mine to provide me with their A24 horror rankings. So here we have rankings provided by Asian Andy, Atar, and Nexpo. Asian Andy, though a big fan of film, isn't as much into horror film, which is why his list is smaller. But I think that's also why Enemy is at the top of his list. What really stands out to me is how Climax is at the top of Atar's list, while at the bottom of Nexpo's. I've noticed that it's quite a controversial film. People either seem to love it or hate it. Both of them have Midsummer much higher up than I do, but we all have The Lighthouse close to the top. Atar and I also agree on Lamb. That movie sucks. I also reached out to Twitter to ask all of you what your favorite A24 horror movies were. You all almost unanimously responded with The Lighthouse, but there were a few outliers, with people mentioning films like Hereditary and The Black Coat's Daughter. I did all of this to illustrate how everyone has different tastes in film. I think that this diversity of taste makes both filmmaking and film discussion exciting. How boring would movies be if everyone liked the exact same thing? 
I mean, I guess we all do like The Lighthouse, but you get what I'm saying. How would you rank these movies? What's your favorite A24 horror film? What's your favorite horror movie? Let me know in the comments. I've been the Kino Corner, and I will see you all in the next video.